Catherine, Bishop of the Church of God, we have looked forward to your coming with great joy. In the name of Christ, we greet you. In the name of Christ, we greet you. With all my heart, I thank you for your welcome. I hope to serve among you in Christ's name and in the joy of the Spirit. May the peace of God be upon this house and upon this assembly. Catherine, receive this bread and wine and lead us in sharing in Christ's presence through the bread broken and the cup poured out. My brothers and sisters, may God renew in us today the love of Christ, who seeks to make all welcome at the table in his Eucharistic feast. Brothers and sisters in Christ, greet the 26th presiding bishop. Now to a story you'll see only on five. Eyewitness News Vice Tyler Suters has a revealing interview with the most reverend Catherine Jeffrey Shorey. It is the religion of our founding fathers, but right now the Episcopal Church is led by a mother. The Right Reverend Catherine Jeffords Shorey is the first woman ever to head the U.S. branch of the Anglican Church, a faith that goes back five centuries. And she came to the Metro last month, leading the ordination of the church's new bishop of Oklahoma, a ceremony the presiding bishop's own daughter, a pilot who lives in South Oklahoma City, had to miss because of a military assignment. Tonight in Straight Talk, my conversation with a groundbreaking minister, now leading a church facing challenging times within. Um, your daughter, Kate Harris, is a pilot who flies out of Tinker Air Force Base, who is missing this entire weekend because she's on a mission. Uh, I assume as a, as a pilot yourself, you understand. Well, I, I do. When the weather is appropriate, you can fly, and when it isn't, uh, you sit and wait. <laughs> well, my daughter's a fourth generation pilot. My father was a Navy pilot, and his father was also a pilot, although his family didn't know about it until after he was dead. Uh, it sounds like you have a bit of risk taker in you as well by uh, accepting this position and the challenges that come with it. Well, I think life's pretty boring if you're not willing to risk. Uh, I don't think I don't mean wanton risk taking, but appropriate risk taking. It's part of growing. Mm -hmm. When you speak of growing, uh, I think of the controversy that the Episcopal Church is facing right now, and that is the uh, everything falls under the umbrella of addressing the issue of homosexuality. Is your approach something of uh, a risk-taking approach in addressing that? My goal is reconciliation. We're wrestling in this country with change at all sorts of levels, with who is in the community and who must be excluded from the community. And the church's long, long understanding is that Jesus invites all to the table. And we've wrestled in this 
country in this church with the place of African Americans and slaves in the church. We've wrestled with the place of women in the church. We've wrestled since this new prayer book of 1979 uh, with the place of children in the church, uh, whether they're welcome to communion or not. And we're now wrestling with the place of gay and lesbian people in the church. And I'm convinced that we'll find some other group to focus on in the future. I don't know who it's going to be, but, but that is human nature. Is the current challenge one that every denomination will face at some point? Most of the mainline denominations are wrestling with the same issue of homosexuality right now. The, the, it, it's an issue that's present in our culture. And the place of faith is to help us live within the culture where we find ourselves as faithful human beings. In that context then, lawmakers are very quick to take up the church as a mantle. Is it proper for religious leaders to take up policy making as a mantle as well? Well, if you look at what Jesus did, he was very much a political animal. Um, I understand politics as being the art of living together in community. It doesn't have to be a dirty word, it doesn't have to be something we avoid, but it is a, a tool for helping human communities to be more than they could without that tool. Mm -hmm. Policy aside, especially the current administration, are we in the midst of a crusade? Is Christianity battling Islam on a global mm -hmm. scale right now? I think some people understand it that way. Uh, the, the basic goals of Islam and of Christianity have a great deal to do with each other. When we employ violence to get our will, uh, we have transgressed the tenets of our religion, whether it is Judaism or Christianity or Islam. Uh, there is, at the root of each of those great traditions, a seeking after peace. And when we seek to impose our will or our, our particular limited understanding on other people, we generally do violence. Final question for you, when you talk about the changing face of God to believers, there's also a changing face of the people who are our intermediaries, the clergy. Mm -hmm. You haven't been a lifelong member of the clergy, uh, former marine biologist. Uh, we talked about how much you enjoy being a pilot. Is that the new trend for clergy members to have somewhat of a, uh, a social life, a secular <laughs> life before they, before they join the church? Oh. I think there's an increasing trend to bless the gifts of people of all ages. I think there was a season in the church when younger people were discouraged from seeking a vocation as an ordained person. I think we're reclaiming the gifts that young people bring and doing that in very, very important ways. U.S. Episcopal bishops met late last month to talk about the rift and thanks in large part to the presiding bishop's desire to reconcile, both sides generally acknowledge that progress is indeed coming. Now for a closer look at her comments on the House of Bishops meeting, we have a link on our website. You can go to the As Seen on 5 section of KOCO.com. With Straight Talk, I'm Tyler Suter. Well, it was, it was a glorious service. Um, it was a gathering of the family. Um, there were some uh, troubling elements and some, some pieces of it that um, really spoke to our, uh, to our present state. The Buddhist chant at the end of uh, the sermon was certainly troubling. And um, a number of our brothers didn't make their communions. Uh, I'm in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury, though deeply troubled about the current state of things uh, and uh, the, uh, the way in which uh, the communion is, is fractured. I think the Episcopal Church has strayed from the truth in very, some very substantial ways. There is unclarity about who Jesus is, is the only Savior of the world. Uh, there is uh, unclarity uh, about moral faith in the church and, and uh, what Christians have always held and believed. Uh, there is um, unclarity about the authority of scripture. So those are the great things and those are very, those are fundamental things. We've gathered from all over the world. We have a major crisis. A family that doesn't face into the crisis it has is a family that's going to fall apart. Certainly, we're praying, we're working. Um, uh, we want to witness Christ's love to all the world, but love always has within it hard words as well as easy words. So. What's transpired? Okay. What is transpired? All right. Diocese of San Joaquin, 
uh, a year ago, almost a year ago, their convention had a, a vote um, in which many people decided that they were going to leave the Episcopal Church and align with the Anglican province of the Southern Cone, which is South America, the southern part of South America. Uh, the bishop was deposed after that, uh, and there were no standing committee members left who were still members of the Episcopal Church. The result was that I went to San Joaquin in March to get, gather the people remaining in the Episcopal Church in a convention. They elected new leadership, including a bishop, a provisional bishop, who will serve there for two or three years. They are recovering. They are experiencing growth in a number of their congregations. Uh, most people who are looking for a church are not terribly interested in joining a church that's in intense conflict. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to either. Uh, but the good news is that they are welcoming new people into their midst. They're in some significant financial distress, as you might imagine, uh, given that many people have departed and the Episcopal Church as a whole is supporting them financially in their recovery efforts. The Diocese of Pittsburgh, uh, Robert Duncan, who was their bishop, was deposed in September for his statements and his actions in violation of the canons of this church, particularly around encouraging people to depart this church. That diocese is also in the recovery process. They had one standing committee member remaining in the Episcopal Church, and he was able to repopulate the standing committee to appoint other members. They will have a convention in early December at which they will elect other diocesan leadership that's needed and possibly um, appoint an assisting bishop. They're not quite sure yet whether they want to elect a provisional bishop or ask for an assisting bishop. And the difference is basically whether or not the bishop has jurisdiction. They're in uh, a rather different kind of situation. There are more of them in Pittsburgh, and they are likely to be closer to financial self-sufficiency. Both of those places are in a, some, something of a limbo because the departing people have insisted that they have the right to remove the buildings and the bank accounts and the silver and the memorials that were given to those congregations. We don't believe they do. Uh, we believe that those are legacies given by generations before us for the benefit of this generation and generations yet to come for ministry in the name of Jesus. Uh, conducted through the Episcopal Church. And if you're no longer part of the Episcopal Church, we don't have the ability to say, go and take all this with you. So there will be some, probably some litigation in both places to settle those questions. The, uh, a number of bishops have just made a statement of dissociation from the decisions that were made vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Windsor Report, uh, calling them uh, inadequate, uh, suggesting that those, uh, that those decisions also uh, give a false sense to the communion of uh, our intention to, to follow through. Uh, we also uh, have made our intention known to uh, uh, be uh, uh, to, to minister to folks wherever they they need that ministry. Um, our task is to guard the unity, faith, and discipline of the church as bishops, um, and to, to guard the flock. And uh, we uh, we will do as as we need to do, um, and uh, and and go forward. We think that the uh, the Windsor resolutions, given the way this convention has 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 has. Uh, run out, uh, that decisions really uh, choosing the, 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 most, uh, uh, the most radical of the PB candidates, uh, the decision of the House of Deputies uh, uh, yesterday, just yesterday, uh, that, uh, that rejected Windsor, um, 
these things are, are really a truer picture of where the American church is. Uh, I can also say that um, a group of at least 30 bishops on the left have uh, made a statement uh, of conscience uh, also on that side of the church saying that they can't support uh, the, the, uh, the compromise that's been made. So we're, we're again in, in, in quite a muddle as we try to go forward uh, in our life in the communion. For us in the Anglican Communion Network and for the wider group of Windsor bishops, we're going to stand uh, for the principles that communion has, uh, uh, has outlined. After all, the, the press will recall that uh, it was the bishops who became the network who just three years ago stood in front of the House of Bishops and uh, called on the Archbishop of Canterbury to intervene. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, did, with the primates, intervene and begin this process which called the American Church to account. Um, the American Church, in our opinion, still hasn't given an adequate answer. Would you call this a fudge, Bishop? Well, yeah, yes, I mean, I, I would call, we were asked to do certain things clearly. That's not the assessment at all, uh, but I'd say it, it's a fudge. Well, again, what's really important is that, that here, here comes another one of the bishops, uh, Bishop Schofield of, of San Joaquin. Uh, the, the, our ability to, to, to craft this, the chief architect of our statement of dissociation was Jim Stanton uh, of Dallas. He left this morning. Ed Salmon was a co-author of the, the, the statement. He left this morning. Uh, there are a fair number of our bishops who, who've already left. There were ten of us left in the House who, who, who dissociated. There were two other bishops who dissociated by other statements who would be called on the conserving side. And they say there are 30 uh, uh, on the, the progressive side that, that have issued their own statement of conscience uh, questioning what's been done. So that's where we are. You spoke of having to do what, what you need to do. Does that include a formal split? But we've always maintained that we're the, the church that's operating under the Constitution of the Episcopal Church. Uh, it's the rest of the communion in the end that's going to have to sort this out. I understand that the presiding bishop in his press conference just a little bit ago was asked what he'd do with the, uh, uh, the, the appeal of the, of the Diocese of Fort Worth, uh, and that he said it's up to the Windsor Commission, up to the, the, uh, the panel of reference, to make that determination. So again, others outside are going to have to judge the situation. Um, when they need that ministry, will that means you'll be crossing diocesan boundaries? Well, I, I think, well, I, 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 let me say about uh, diocesan boundaries that the diocesan boundaries have broken down. Um, the question in the history of the church uh, has always been that when there are bishops who are unfaithful, that is not speaking the truth, uh, that they are actually, they're, they're, those, those historic rules don't hold. Um, We'll take counsel in each of our dioceses for, for how we respond to this. Again, the, the Diocese of Pittsburgh, of which I'm the bishop, uh, will stand as we've stood. Uh, we, we are the Episcopal Diocese of Pittsburgh. I am the Episcopal Bishop of Pittsburgh. And we're going forward with the communion and uh, in the direction that we're moving. You might want to uh, uh, see if uh, Bishop John David uh, has some things. I, I think he's the only other network bishop who's out here just now. Oh, we got to, oh look, at, isn't it wonderful how our numbers have grown? <laughs> that may respond Bishop to the Michael. question of crossing diocesan boundaries. I think there should be crossing of diocesan boundaries at the invitation of the revisionist bishops who have divided our church so deeply. I think they should relinquish pastoral oversight of their traditionalist congregations to network bishops, and we should begin to enact legislation that will allow congregations to remove themselves canonically from their diocese and affiliate with an Orthodox Anglican Communion diocese. And that, as I say, ought to be at the invitation of those who have divided the church so badly. Bishop, can you say your name? And your we, wrote, we wrote the canons which prohibit this, and we can rewrite the canons in order to enable it and welcome it. Jack Eicher, Diocese of Fort Worth. Bishop, could you comment on the Archbishop Canterbury's statement that he appreciated the seriousness with which his convention has considered the Windsor Report? I haven't heard any statement from the Archbishop of Canterbury, it was recent. but all of us realize that this has been undertaken with a great deal of seriousness. Uh, but we've come to different conclusions at its termination, haven't we? Presiding Bishop Griswold said he spoke with the Archbishop recently. Have anybody with the uh, network spoken with the Archbishop or his representatives? Yes, I think so. I think, I think it's, it's fair to say that there have been conversations. Okay, have, 
can we get any report on that? I think we we generally don't. Uh, we don't want. We're not going to say anything about that. Okay. He understands our concerns. Bishop Iker, could you again state what you're seeking because of the election of the new presiding bishop? To yes. Re relationships among bishops are very important for the unity and welfare of the church. Because of the theological position she holds in this time of great division in the communion, I'm in an impaired relationship with the new presiding bishop-elect. Uh, there are different ways of thinking what the presiding bishop is. Uh, it's not just the presiding officer at meetings of the House of Bishops. It's also the chief pastor uh, and primate of the church. When I'm not in a collegial relationship with my chief pastor, I need to look someplace else. It's an extension of the kind of thing that we've offered to congregations who are uh, alienated from their diocesan bishop. Depot uh, is a program that is supposedly uh, set up to allow a congregation who's alienated from their diocesan bishop to enter into a pastoral collegial relationship with a more sympathetic bishop. When I'm not in a collegial relationship with my chief pastor, I need to look someplace else. It's an extension of the kind of thing that we've offered to congregations who are uh, alienated from their diocesan bishop. Depot uh, is a program that is supposedly uh, set up to allow a congregation who's alienated from their diocesan bishop to enter into a pastoral collegial relationship with a more sympathetic bishop. We're simply applying that on a diocesan level to say that when we are not in a full um, communion relationship with our new presiding bishop, we ought to be placed in a pastor relationship receiving episcopal care and oversight from an orthodox primate who upholds the teaching of scriptures and who is true to the uh, positions of uh, the Lambeth Conference expressed in Lambeth 110 resolution on human sexuality. Does the network feel that the House of Bishops, the House of Deputies, and the presiding bishop has chosen to walk apart? I think that the House of Deputies is schizophrenic. Two days ago, they voted down these resolutions, and today, if I understand correctly, they voted through one that they were most adamantly opposed to. I'm not sure how you can be of two different minds within two different days. What I think the concern is that they're trying to give them the perception that the Episcopal Church is going to change direction, when the truth of the matter is we're not changing direction. We simply don't want to prevent our new presiding bishop from having an opportunity to go to a primates meeting. Bishop, when you say impaired with the newly elected PB, tell me practically what does that mean for your diocese? If well, for, for me personally, being in a diocese which doesn't accept uh, the ordination of women to the priesthood and episcopate, it puts us in a, a compromising position of being told that we are now under the primatial authority of someone that we question really is a bishop. It's nothing against Catherine Shorey personally, obviously. It's nothing against women. It's a theological position, and we believe that the ordination of women to the priesthood and episcopate is a fundamental break with apostolic tradition and biblical teaching. Uh, Benedict XVI happens to agree with the position that we hold, as does the vast majority of Catholic Christians, Orthodox Christians around the world. This morning at my table, uh, as we were voting on uh, the resolution that said we were going to embrace uh, the Windsor Report, a bishop sitting directly opposite me smiled and said, that will never hold where I come from. You know better than that, Schofield. And so what he was saying, even as we were voting, was that he was prepared to disobey uh, the Windsor Report and was prepared to go right on um, blessing same-sex unions and also um, proposing people and uh, proposing consents for uh, election to the Episcopate of uh, men and women uh, who were living outside the bonds of matrimony. In visiting the 110 dioceses which existed when I started in office, and I think about 25 of the provinces of the Anglican Communion, my sense is that people of faith in all of those contexts are getting on with loving Jesus and trying to love their neighbors as themselves. Um, 
things get in the way, uh, you know, normal human spiritual challenges of, you know, me first, or uh, I'd rather be angry about this than find a creative way through it. But long term, I think most people remember that they are beloved of God and their role in this world is to find a way to produce a place of greater peace and harmony. I see hope wherever people are trying something new and creative to respond to the needs of their neighbors. You know, whether it's feeding people in a soup kitchen or a shared meal in a parish congregational setting, or advocating with a legislature about producing a legal system that is more welcoming to all God's people and that ensures greater fairness and equity in this world. Uh, I've, I've seen the presence of God in, you know, children hungry for communion, <laughs> uh, people in hospitals grateful for the service that's offered there, the healing possibility. I've seen God in the faces of Palestinians and Israelis trying to find ways to build a more peaceful society. Um, I see hope in the presence of God wherever people are vulnerable enough to recognize both their own need and the need of their neighbors. I said in my message to the church last week that I thought we were beyond the conflict that marked the beginning of my term in office. Uh, Episcopalians were fighting with one another all over the place about their understanding of what it means to be a human being and who can be included in that understanding of a normative human being. Uh, it has a great deal to do with um, whether people recognize that sexual orientation is, uh, occurs across a spectrum and that it's not solely binary and it's not just uh, male and female and that's the end of it. Uh, but it's far more complex than that. Uh, it's been a challenge, it still is a challenge in some places, for people to understand the complexity of that part of human existence. The conflict comes when some people decide that one sort of human being is okay and welcome in this community and another sort of human being is not. Uh, that's, I think, probably the deepest definition of sin we decide that some people aren't made in the image of God. We're all made in the image of God. I think we began to get beyond it as we recognized the pain that is shared across the spectrum of humanity because of who we are and the world we live in. Uh, you know, I saw it very early on in the response to Katrina. People from, you know, theologically orthodox conservative congregations and people from more progressive more progressive ones, were down there mucking out people's houses. And when they were focused on somebody else and the needs of somebody else, they suddenly realized that they had way more in common than the few things they disagreed about. Uh, I think that ability to be called out of ourselves is the, always the route to healing those kinds of conflicts that are so focused on um, self and inwardness. This church is healed by turning outward, by remembering that our task is to love our neighbors and not just the people who sit in the pews with us. <laughs> people often talk about the fact that I'm the first woman elected as a primate in the Anglican Communion. The sad reality is that I think that some people are afraid of women in leadership. Um, some people are simply not used to it and have never imagined it, and so it's therefore a, a, a cognitive challenge. Uh, when I went to the first primates meeting in Dar es Salaam, uh, I had conversations with everybody who was there. They weren't always deep conversations, um, but we, we talked, all of us talked to one another. Uh, confronted with the incarnate reality of another human being, most of us can find constructive ways of conversing with one another, building some kind of bridge. Uh, but if we stay away from that kind of encounter, if we um, say, well, I will not sit down with that person, uh, there's no possibility of that. The, the, the great unfortunate reality is that when we only do our communicating on the Internet or at a distance, uh, we don't 
we lose that opportunity for conversion, which is what conversation is able to produce. I delight in the fact that Episcopalians across this church know more about one another, that more Episcopalians understand our, uh, our diversity, that we're a multinational and multilingual and multicultural everywhere, even if they hadn't noticed before. I rejoice in the fact that people are beginning to understand that we're present in Europe and in Latin America and in Asia and the Pacific as well as in the United States. I, I delight in the fact that more and more congregations and dioceses are building relationships across the world, uh, that those relationships are deepening our understanding of what it's like to be a Christian or a person of faith in another context. Uh, I delight in the fact that we have turned outward in most places, that we're not just focused on our internal conflicts. Uh, that's the route of death, to be turned inward on your conflict, uh, because it doesn't lead to new life. What does the reign of God look like when it actually happens? Well, it's a central part of our prayer. Um, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, my understanding of that is a society of peace, and it's peaceful because there's justice, because nobody lives in want, uh, nobody has too much, everybody has not just the bare minimum, but enough for a feast. And those are the kinds of images that the biblical prophets hold up over and over again. Um, Isaiah's vision of a great picnic on the mountainside uh, with good food and good wine and rest and time for leisure, you know, the, the, the true understanding of Sabbath that's recreative, uh, that's a taste of the Garden of Eden that we understood was the intent for or the whole of creation. Uh, we see glimpses of it in this life, particularly when social ills are remedied, when we address the scandal of um, discrimination against young people of color that we're noticing finally in this country, uh, when we're engaged in relieving the refugee challenges in Europe at the moment and in Central America, uh, when we're helping handicapped children in Haiti uh, to lead productive lives. Those are signs of the reign of God among us and around us. The biblical images that I think undergird my spiritual understanding are those great visions of what, what the world ought to look like, uh, the, the great prophetic images about justice and peace. Uh, Jesus, in his first act of public ministry, goes to the synagogue in Nazareth and reads from Isaiah 61 about being anointed to bring good news to the poor and healing to the blind and release to the prisoner and the captive. Uh, and then he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Uh, it, it is if, if, at the very least, it's a reminder that at this moment uh, that reality can be fulfilled all around us. It is when we notice that happening and when we participate in its happening. Uh, the great images about let justice roll down like waters and righteousness, righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, uh, that, that's the basic human yearning for reconnection with all that is holy, all that is right and possible in this world. Uh, and I can think of nothing that's more central to it than the reconnection with God that we understand through Jesus Christ. What have my prayers been in this, in this season? Uh, that I might be fully present in each encounter, looking for the image of God and the conversation partners and the people I meet, that I might be a a breath of peace rather than increasing the level of conflict, um, that I might hold out a vision that is hopeful and possible in this world. What's next for me is uh, still somewhat up in the air. I'm gonna, going to go and teach at Virginia Seminary in the spring semester. I'm going to teach a course on religion and science and one on the spirituality of peacemaking and hope that that is a fruitful time of discernment for the next chapter. I'm immensely grateful for the people I've been able to work with over these nine years. 
Uh, the staff of the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society are gifted, passionate people who are helping to change this world into something that looks more like the reign of God. They do it by partnering with Episcopalians and Anglicans and people of faith across this country and across the globe. And I'm just enormously grateful for that privilege.